Okay. So, uh, okay. Um, all right. I think you can see my screen. Um, there yep. are a couple that have been joining from home, um, but hopefully uh, got one. Hopefully we'll get the other one here in a second. So as I was saying before, I was so rudely cut off by Zoom. Uh, when we're uh, after we process this zero one is unique. We look at this zero that's been done. A zero zero has been done. So that's not unique, but a zero 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 is unique. So we write that down. And all along now we've been recording these in our dictionary contents. These dictionary locations are just incrementing uh, by one uh, value of uh, binary one each time, right? So uh, now we look at the next one and we have a one and a one and a uh so one one is not unique but a one 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 is right and uh here we do the next one zero zero has already been done but zero zero one has not so that's unique then uh we go to this next one and whoa we we jumped a lot here right because uh zero zero one is not unique. That's the one we just encoded. So we actually have to keep going. And a zero, zero, one, one, uh, that is unique. So we record that. Then we step to the next digit. A one isn't unique. One zero is not unique, but one zero, zero actually is. So note that we're not necessarily increasing um, the uh, number of digits each time. Uh, we're looking for that unique pattern, right? So one zero zero is unique. So we record that and then step to the next one. Finally, one one zero. Is that one unique? Yes, it is. So now we've uh, recorded all of these, right? So this might go on for, uh, you know, pages and pages, right? So if you're, you're encoding, let's say a image, and uh, these are the RGB pixel values of the image in some number of bits of resolution, let's say 8-bit color or 32-bit color or something like that, right? And um, so you're doing that in an ordered fashion and you're uh, uh, starting from, let's say, the top left coordinate and encoding the R pixel value and then the uh, uh, R, B, G, uh, B, uh, the blue pixel, and then the green pixel, and then stepping to the next pixel in that two-dimensional picture, right? So you're, you're dealing with gigabytes, uh, gigabits of, uh, uh, information potentially that you're encoding here, right? Um, so this is just a kind of a trivial, uh, example of, um, uh, doing this very short top thing. It'll be shorter on the test even, right? So um, now, uh, so we've encoded all these bits and built this up in a, a table, in a, in a dictionary. And now we need to generate the code words, right? And the code words start with the, um, we look at these dictionary contents and we look at the unique um, part of the bit. Uh, and uh, look, which is generally going to generally going to be the uh, the last digit, right? Um, and we're going to then uh, find the previous dictionary location, right? So maybe I'm not explaining that very well, but again, example uh, will help here. So we start off with. Uh, a dictionary location of zero 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 zero, and uh, then we add what is uh, unique about that. So it's zero 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 zero, right? And then uh, here uh, we don't have a previous one to look at, so we're again going to use zero 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 zero, and then add that one. Okay. Now here's where it starts to get interesting. We look at this uh, zero here, the left one. And we find that in the dictionary, 
that's at this location 0, 0, 0, 001. So we write that location down and uh, I've italicized these dictionary locations to make it slightly easier to follow, right? So we have 0, 0, 0, 001, that is the this dictionary location that holds the contents zero, which is um, this left part of the contents. Then we add in that unique part or the zero, okay? And then we step to the next one. Here we have a one zero. Where can we find that one? We find that one here at this dictionary location zero zero one zero. So we write that zero zero one zero and then that uh, last digit, we write that in zero. We continue on here, same thing. We're looking for this one, that's a zero, zero, one, zero, but now we add a one. Okay, so, so far all these code words should be unique, right? Now we look at this uh, contents, that zero, that's found at zero, 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 one. So we write that zero, 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 one, and then we write that one down. Okay, uh, here we have zero, zero, zero. We need to find that uh, zero, zero location. That's here, zero, zero, one, one. So we write that down. And, and again, this is the italicized portion, zero, zero, one, one. And we add in that last digit, zero. Okay, uh, one, one is found here, zero, one, zero, one, and then one. Zero, zero, again, is zero, zero, uh, one, one. And uh, where am I at? Zero, zero, one, one, and then add that one. Okay, here's interesting. Uh, let's look at this zero, zero, one. So we, we jumped up uh, a digit here in our contents, but let's still find that unique portion. That's a zero, zero, one, um, which is right here, right above us, right? So it's one, zero, zero, one, and a one. Because of the way we generated these dictionary contents, looking for these unique phrases, right? So we kept looking until we just got a unique value, right? So that's going to be done by adding a uh, uh, one more thing besides what's already in that dictionary contents. So once we get bootstrapped with these uh, dictionary locations of 0000, zero, zero, zero once we get past that, we're always going to find the prior X number of bits in the dictionary and only going to need to be adding that last digit in this rightmost uh, position in the code word, right? So for these uh, previous parts, uh, uh, your uh because of the way you constructed this dictionary, you should be able to find all but that last digit, right? Uh, all but this rightmost digit. You should always be able to find that in the dictionary some way, somewhere. You find it, you determine that address, that location, you write that down, and then you write down the digit that makes it unique, okay? And so then this becomes your code word that you send, right? So if um, now to actually answer it, so we're going to send that code word plus this code word plus this code word plus that code word and all the way down to this code word encodes that last one, one, zero, right? And so uh, again, uh, to mention the uh, this does not look like a, a very efficient means of encoding this uh, this string here, uh, th this set of bits. Um, it becomes efficient when the number of bits up here becomes extraordinarily large, right? So we've got maybe a few dozen here, and uh, but if you're talking uh, uh, millions uh, and especially billions of uh, source bits, then this technique is going to ultimately be very efficient because what you're doing is you're encoding most of the word using a dictionary location and stuff. So uh, you just need uh, the ability for that to catch up with you.
All right, so finally, uh, we do this cascaded noise uh, figure analysis. Here I gave you three different amplifiers. Uh, if it wasn't obvious, this is the input over here on the left and the output over here on the right. Hopefully the arrows uh, and the shape of these amplifier symbols uh, give you that. But gain one is 7 dB, noise figure 0.9 dB. Um, oh, I guess when... Uh, when I started writing out the solutions, it didn't format well. So um, gain two is 10 dB, a little bit higher noise figure. Gain uh, three stage is 15 dB with uh, even higher noise figure. So this whole chain is what, 32 dB of gain, right? Uh, which is probably not unreasonable amount in a receiver, right? And um, now you are looking at uh, noise figures. Uh, typically, the noise figure is going to get worse when you're trying to achieve higher gain out of any single stage or uh, a kind of composite amplifier. So uh, this is the equation we use uh, for cascading those noise figures. And so our uh, total noise figure, or in this case, the noise factor, uh, is uh, the first one plus the second one through this kind of scaling relationship with respect to uh, the previous stage's gain, right? So a uh, way to think about that is that this signal, by the time it gets to the input of amplifier 2, has been amplified by this first stage, right? So uh, this noise figure and noise factor here is already dealing with an amplified signal. And the same thing here is that by the time you get to stage three, its input has already been amplified by gains one and two, right? So when you're working in dBs, you can add, but when uh, you're working in linear, now you're multiplying and, and dividing, right? So um, that uh, in this case, well, kind of seems like we're doing both, but these these noise factors are accumulating, but we need to uh, uh, change them into uh, linear units so that we can uh, divide by the gain here. So um, we take uh, 7 dB divided by 10, that's 0.7, uh, do a 10 to the X, uh, so 10 to the 0.7, should be uh, like 1.23, so not a lot of gain. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 5.012, that, that makes more sense, right? So uh, a gain of five, uh, so the signal coming out is five times as high or seven dB uh, larger, right? Uh, we do the same thing with the noise uh, figure, converting it to a noise factor. And uh, so we do that, note that uh, I give you the, the gain of uh, G3, um, it doesn't really uh, come into play in this equation, right? Because uh, uh, that would only apply if we're to have no the noise figure, noise factor of the subsequent stage. So uh, here we just plug and chug, uh, and we end up with a noise figure that is bigger than the original one, um, but uh, still not so bad, right? So note that uh, that's a noise uh, figure. Actually, I think I asked uh, for the noise uh, factor. So you would do a 10 log uh, base 10 of 1.591 to uh, have the completed answer. Uh, so, uh, and that would, give you the answer in decibels, okay? All right, any questions on that? Okay, um, good, let's, uh, took up a lot of time on uh, homework review. Uh, that is essentially your test prep, uh, along with maybe a conceptual question on spread spectrum. Uh, technology and um, you know what why do we use spread spectrum uh, well it can uh, provide us some immunity to uh, narrowband jammers um, or makes 
makes jamming that signal harder. Uh, or uh, if we're, let's say, in an unlicensed band where we're all kind of competing for access to the band, uh, we might use uh, spread spectrum there also uh, because others could be viewed as interferers to us, right? And even in a uh, licensed band where it's managed by a base station controller, let's say in 3G uh, cell phone communications, um, uh, there's by using spread spectrum, we can still have uh, multiple users using that same spectrum right on top of each other. But by using different spreading techniques, we can uh, isolate those users. We can go into a lot of detail on that. So uh, just kind of keeping things at that conceptual level. So I might ask uh, some fill in a blank or uh, type of, of questions there. Uh, but don't forget homework three, uh, there we did uh, some block uh, coding, uh, linear block coding. Uh, uh, so that's uh, there'll be some questions on that also, perhaps on generation or perhaps on uh, decoding using syndromes, right? But uh, it will be, um, uh, in all cases, uh, very similar to homework. We didn't do a homework on spread spectrum. So, um, so again, that'll just be conceptual. But uh, but all the other uh, test questions will be uh, simplified versions of your homework. Um, simplified because I know some of these calculations are rather time consuming, uh, can take a while. And so we've got to uh, make sure it's appropriate for the exam. All right. So um, this uh, fading will be a uh, two lecture uh lesson and uh so the second lecture which uh i, I probably won't get very far here because i only have a few more minutes left uh, uh 15 minutes left i guess but um the next lecture will be on uh, multiple input and multiple output type systems that's uh, uh where if you look at uh, some systems you will see uh, that a single radio has multiple antennas on it that's actually uh, multiple RF chains, amplifiers, mixers, all that stuff. Um, and they're uh, um, uh, uh, separate propagation paths between the transmitter and receiver, right? Because these antennas are spaced, spaced apart from each other, right? So uh, that's going to be the following lecture. So that'll be a week from uh, today. And so we'll uh, we'll pick up what we don't get to today on that. So let's look at uh, channel description, um, uh, but motivate this work a little bit, right? So the optimal design of communication system descends directly from a channel model. Uh, we've got to understand our channel in order to be able to uh, optimally design our communication system. Uh, many of the techniques we've studied so far are intended to cope with the non-idealities of the channel. Um, the, uh, every channel is unique. To design a broadly applicable system, we kind of need to look at these channels as, you know, from a statistical or probabilistic uh, perspective, right? So, um, uh, if I'm talking on my cell phone and I move that cell phone, uh, just a few fractions of a wavelength, um, then that's a different channel, right? So um, if I move into a different room, that's a very different channel, right? So we we cannot describe a channel uh, explicitly. We need to look at it in kind of a broad terms uh, statistically, right? So uh, we've considered... Uh, techniques adapted to additive white Gaussian noise uh, channels that are dominated by that kind of noise uh, mechanism. We look briefly at band limited channels that give rise to inter symbol interference, and uh, that we saw that if we used a raised cosine filter in the system, then uh, we can 
reduce significantly the impact of that inner symbol interference. And uh, we've talked a number of times about this multipath fading channel. So um, uh, practical channels for modern mobile communications are all of those things, but we also add in time varying. Right? So now if you think back to your uh, sophomore year and your learning circuits uh, analysis, probably one of the things you you did was you assume, well, you assume your uh, circuit is linear to begin with, so you can use superposition. And somewhere along the line, you assumed it's time invariant, right? And so sometimes we abbreviate that combination as LTI, linear time invariant. So um, unfortunately, the world is not that simple. And uh, in mobile communications in particular, or transceivers, whether it's whether we're, you know, our, our handsets are both transmitters and receivers, right? So it's a transceiver. So in both the, the what we call the downlink or from the base station to the mobile handset, uh, that's time varying. The channel, the uplink channel, uh, the uplink is from your handset to the base station, that's time varying. Uh, even if you uh, were completely stationary, but uh, a truck drives by outside, uh, then um, that uh, big semi-truck could reflect your signal. It's moving, and therefore it, it's acting, we, we would call it a scatterer because it's reflecting or scattering your signal. And um, so that um, impacts a channel, and it's mobile. So real channels are... Uh, quite often time varying, right? Especially radio radio channels, right? All right, so uh, we can look at a ray tracing model. Uh, ray tracing is something that if you studied uh, 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 image processing, graphics design, uh, particularly in, in game design, uh, that type of thing, uh, there's techniques, uh, in optical ray tracing in order to build up a scene. We use the same type of concept in uh, uh, radio waves. So uh, last year, I think in your junior year, you did uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, fields, uh, traveling waves, that type of thing. And uh, you uh, e either there or uh, probably also in your physics class, you saw that if a wave uh, strikes a surface that has a uh, different, um, uh, well, optically, uh, uh, index of refraction, but uh, EM-wise uh, and radio waves, we would uh, talk about its impedance, right? And um, so then it's going to refract and or reflect, right? So, uh, and it's going to do that uh, with respect to the surface normal, the normal to the surface. Now, not everything's perfectly flat surfaces, but uh, if it's round, we approximate that um, point where the uh, wave reflects off of that surface as a tangential plane. Even if it's round, we'll, we'll look at the plane that's tangent at that point and look at the surface normal to that uh, plane, and we know that if it's going to reflect, um, then it's going to reflect at an angle that's equal to the incident uh, with respect to that surface normal, right? So um, I don't know if that, uh, hopefully that, that makes sense. I think I've got a drawing here in a moment. Um, we should also note that rays uh, can be shadowed or blocked by large structures. Okay, so there could be a building in a way or a wall in the way. And uh, so uh, we can produce a shadow behind that uh, with respect to the transmitter, right? So uh, again, these are uh, waves. Waves have wave fronts to them. Um, but when what we're reflecting off of is large with respect to the wavelength, 
then we can kind of simplify it and just draw it as a ray, which is essentially a vector, right? So a line. Um, now we should note that in addition to this potential direct path or what we call a line of sight path from the transmitter to the receiver, there exists a series of reflected rays. And I've talked about this a number of times, pointing out that that direct path, uh, we learned from geometry that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So any uh, thing else is going to be longer, right? And, um, but um, uh, depending upon the relative positions of the transmitter, receiver, and any reflectors or scatterers, then we will have a subset of rays combining at the receiver, right? Now, some rays will bounce off of a reflector and go off in a completely different direction and never reach the receiver, right? So it's only those that kind of match this Snell's, Snell's law or Snell's Descartes uh, law. There's actually a whole bunch of different people that have uh, uh, observed this even prior to these guys, but uh, it's named after, after them. And um, so uh, the important thing to note though, is that each ray travels potentially different distance and therefore have a different delay, okay? probably should be has, a uh, different delay, phase and amplitude when it combines at the receiver. It actually uh, combines vectorially, right? So not just amplitude, but phase and in the receiver antenna, right? So that field induces a current into that antenna. That's a linear process and they all combine via superposition. So um, checking the time here. So as a wave travels through a distance of a wavelength, its phase moves through two pi radians or 360 degrees. Right? So we know the wavelength is a function of frequency. So uh, if our distance is fixed, let's say in terms of meters, then uh, the number of wavelengths that that or, or fractions of a wavelength that a wave travels uh, between those two, let's say, fixed points measured in meters, that's going to be a different number of wavelengths if the frequency is different, right? So uh, that means that the phase of a ray at the receiver varies with respect to frequency and that affects how it adds or cancels with the sum of the other rays. All right, so let's let's look at this. Um, so I grabbed some uh, diagrams. These aren't mine. I probably should have attributed these. I think these came from a lecture from the University of Colorado. But um, uh, this top diagram shows a ground bounce or two ray model, right? Here we have a tall antenna and a shorter receive antenna, let's say, it's transmitting in this down length type of fashion, we have this direct path. That's going to be the shortest path. But we also are reflecting off the ground. The ground tends to be a pretty good conductor, and so it uh, looks like a short circuit, and therefore that signal is going to reflect. And um, at the right angle, that's going to sum here, right? So there'll be some energy that comes down here, uh, maybe bounces before that location, but it's going to uh, reflect off here into Neverland, right? And we've got another one that might bounce off a little bit farther away. And again, it's going to reflect off to some other oblivion there, right? But there is going to be a ray that geometrically satisfies this condition where it's going to reach the receiver antenna, but at a delayed version of this direct path, likely also attenuated, right? So we're not going to get a perfect reflection here. It's going to attenuate. It's also traveling farther, so it's going to uh, suffer some attenuation there also. Um, so, uh, oops. Now, more complex environments can have many reflections, right? So now, 
This is uh, what an elevation view. This is more of a plan view. If I have my terminology uh, correct here. So we're looking top down here and there's a wall here and a wall there. So it looks like a corridor, right? So we might uh, have a direct path from transmitter receiver in this case, uh, but we also might be bouncing off these walls. And in fact, we could bounce a couple of times off the walls, right? Uh, as these dash lines indicate. Uh, in all of these cases, we are also having this ground bounce, right? So this is a top-down view. And so uh, you might have the direct path and you might have a, uh, a ground bounce. And in fact, if you know this is in a building, you might have a bounce off the ceiling. So you can see that these complex environments can have many, many reflections. All right. So uh, what does this end up looking like, right? So uh, uh, perhaps you study a path loft equation in uh, your fields course, your uh, applied electromagnetics course, I think is what we call it here. And um, uh, but at any rate, because that uh, electromagnetic wave front, as it propagates away from an an a transmitter antenna, it's spreading out in two dimensions as it travels to the receiver. The receiver antenna only intersects a, a fraction of that, right? So uh, depending upon the antenna gains uh, and how much it focuses that energy in the right direction, um, you're going to suffer a loss as you move away from the antennas, as you, as you separate those antennas farther and farther, right? Up to a kilometer or 10 kilometers, you're getting more and more loss. Right, but uh, this solid line shows uh, what happens when you just have two rays, right? Where you have this ground bounce, and you will see you have these deep nulls, or what we call these deep fades, uh, where the signals are canceling. Sometimes they add constructively, and you actually uh, get a little bit of a boost. But um, uh, and that's cool, but uh, too much of the time we're down here, right? And you can see that, uh, boy, if you're really unlucky, you're, you're paying, even here is like a 30 dB uh, penalty. So uh, it's a big deal. Fortunately, these guys in, in this regime, at least, are pretty narrow in frequency, right? So, uh, or, or in distance, I'm sorry. Uh, similar top thing happens in, in frequency. But um, if we move just a little bit, uh, will come out of that null and we can start talking again, All right? So uh, now um, I think I will stop here uh, before I, I go on. So um, yeah, I'll uh, try to remember where I stopped and we will uh, have the exam on uh, Tuesday and pick this lecture up uh, again on uh uh, Friday, we'll talk, uh, cover a few more topics. Uh, 5G, um, we'll uh, just kind of survey 5G type stuff real quickly and uh, hopefully have a chance to talk about some trends in um, communications research, what's the latest and greatest, and uh, talk a little bit about the standards process. Most, many communication systems are driven by standards, so it's helpful to understand that. And um, yeah, we'll have a review and then the final. So um, it's going to happen fast. Uh, so I did have uh, one person ask for an extension on the extra credit, which I granted. So if you're in that same situation, you think, oh my gosh, I got so much stuff going on and you'd like to participate in the extra credit um, and want, uh, want a little bit of extra time, uh, please make arrangements for that. Um, and uh, stuff. So, uh, or not, have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Friday. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Please, uh, please send me an email if you need any office hours um, and stuff. So, okay. All right. Take care. Bye.